He also said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed? Isn't it to be put on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed, and nothing concealed that will not be brought to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him listen. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. By the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and more will be added to you. For whoever has, more will be given to him, and whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. All right. Hello, hello. How's everybody tonight? Good, good to, good to be together. Uh, we were away uh, this past week. We got back last night into Edmonton around 11.30, so I'm pretty tired. We're going to try our best tonight, though, uh, but it's really great to be back and to, uh, to be together as a church family. Um, <clears throat> as we get started tonight, uh, you know, I know oftentimes when we're kids, we get taught never to judge a book by its cover, but uh, kids are downstairs. Don't worry about it. Let's uh, forget that rule tonight. I want you to look at this picture. What do you think this guy does? Just shout it out. What do you think? What do you think this guy does? Murder? Murderer? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Police officer. Some different answers here. Now we're going to switch the picture up. We're going to zoom out a little bit. Now what do you think he does? Basketball. Basketball. So this guy is a guy named Zach Eady. He is seven feet four inches tall. And he is the starting center for the University of Purdue men's basketball team. And last year, he was the consensus uh, national uh, college basketball player, national basketball player of the year. And he's actually Canadian, which is awesome. And he grew up in Toronto playing mainly two sports. He played, obviously, hockey. Um, and the second sport he played, not basketball, but actually baseball. <coughs> and uh, he... He had no interest playing basketball growing up, even though I think I was reading by third grade, he was, he was almost six feet tall. Um, <clears throat> but even though Zach uh, excelled at both hockey and at baseball, everywhere he and his family went, his parents would always get the same question. Why doesn't he play basketball? So eventually Zach gave in. He started playing basketball when he was in grade 10, that was the first time he played organized basketball. And a lot of people started taking notice, and then one thing led to the next, and he eventually commits to playing for Purdue and became the best basketball player in college basketball, which is amazing. And that's all before heading into his senior season, which just started a few weeks ago. You know, it's hard to ignore when you're 7'4", that maybe basketball might be part of your future. Maybe, uh, maybe volleyball, but uh, you know, when you're 7'4", uh, basketball seems like a very obvious choice. You know, some might even look at a guy like Zach and say, you were made for this. What do you think someone would say about you, about what you are meant to be, what you are meant to do? What are some of the, the attributes that you have? What are some of, the, some of the different ways you act to make someone look at you and say, wow, this person was made for this? As followers of Christ, is there something about us that shows others that we were made to be Christ's disciples? Something that makes it known to others that we believe in him. You know, we uh, heard this uh, passage of scripture read earlier, but we're going to read it again. This is what we're going to look at tonight. This is Mark chapter 4, verses 21 to 25. And I'd actually love it. Uh, the words will be on the screen if you have your Bibles open up to, to Mark chapter 4. Uh, but I actually love it if we could all stand for the reading of God's word, and let's uh, read it out loud together. So this is Mark 4, 21 to 25. He also said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed? Isn't it to be put on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed, and nothing concealed that will not be brought to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him listen. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. By the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and more will be added to you. For whoever has more will be given to him, 
And whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. You guys can grab a seat. So in this passage, the lamp represents the truth which the Lord gives to his disciples. And similarly for us, like it was for Christ's original disciples, you know, we hold this incredible light that is the truth and the knowledge of salvation that comes only through Jesus, only through God's grace and his mercy. But oftentimes, whether we realize it or not, we sometimes keep that light from shining. For some, maybe we feel a certain embarrassment about our faith at times, and we don't want to admit it, but sometimes we see the hurtful things that the church or other Christians have done, and we're embarrassed by that. For some, maybe we lack confidence. In 1 Peter 3, 5, it tells us that when somebody asks you for the reason for your hope, you need to be prepared to give an a confident answer for that. And maybe we just don't have that confidence to answer that question. And because we lack confidence, we live in a way where we actually conceal the light that's inside of us because we don't want people to ask us that question. Looking at the passage that we just read in verse 21, there are two things mentioned that can also cover this light of Christ in our lives, a basket and a bed. And for some scholars, when you look at uh, these words in its original language and its original context, basket can mean work or busyness. Oftentimes, we get so busy that we uh, fail to uh, shine the way that Christ calls us to. Bed can uh, represent laziness or comfort, and that is probably one of the most obvious things. A lot of times, we care about comfort more than being uh, that lamp on a lampstand. But this passage also reminds us in Mark 4, 22, that there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed and nothing concealed that will not be brought to light. So within this verse, I remember as, uh, you know, often when I'm preparing uh, for messages like this uh, and we're assigned a passage to preach on and I'll read it again and again and again, just over and over, trying to get a sense of what God is speaking uh, through this passage. And I remember the first few times I read this verse, it felt a little bit redundant. It says, there's nothing hidden that will not be revealed and nothing concealed that will not be brought to light. It feels like he's saying the same thing twice and feels redundant. But again, when you look at the original context, when you look at the original language, there are actually two different things being talked about here. In the original Greek, the word hidden is the word krypton. And it means concealed, private, secret, hidden. And that's a reminder that we cannot keep our sins, our insecurities, our negative thoughts. We cannot, we will not be able to keep those to ourselves. So it is best to just confess those things. The next word that you find in the next part is the word concealed. So you have hidden and you have concealed. And they're two different words. Concealed, it's the word apocryphon. And it means secret treasure that is stored up. And that's the other part of this is as followers of Christ, we cannot keep secret the light and the truth of the salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. It's the responsibility of every disciple of Jesus to communicate the gospel of the kingdom of God to the world. And people need to be able to look at us as the ones who are shining that light of truth. We were made to be his disciples. We were made to shine like lamps on lampstands. But church, I know for myself, and uh, I think a lot of us can relate, we have a lot of shortcomings, don't we? And we have this propensity to cover up the light of Christ and salvation and keep our faith private. But this is what God wants to say to us today. This is the next verse. If anyone has ears to hear, let him listen. Any who are able and willing to hear about this good news and light that shines because of the truth that God gives us, listen up humbly and eagerly, receive his word, and see how as you turn your ear towards him that your knowledge 
of him accumulates. God graciously reveals himself to us in so many different ways. He reveals to us through creation so that the world would see his eternal power and divine nature. That's Romans 1.20. We know that those who fear God can grow in knowledge of God. God reveals himself through his scriptures, through other believers, and most importantly, through his son, Jesus. As knowledge of God and his promises, his character, his heart, as those things grow, this light that's within us grows bright, brighter and brighter, and nothing can contain it. In the history of humanity, the drive and the thirst for knowledge has always been a part of our nature. It's innate in us to let knowledge accumulate. We want to know and figure things out and learn about things. But it's also not uncommon for that accumulated knowledge to just kind of sit in ourselves and not actually do anything to help our day-to-day lives. It's good for small talk, trivia, trivia games, but uh, a lot of times not much more, and that knowledge accumulates for no really good reason. But friends, when it comes to God, as knowledge of him accumulates and grows within us, it's never just something that stays within ourselves, but it's knowledge that activates. Knowledge, not knowledge that just accumulates, but knowledge that activates. It's not enough for us to accumulate knowledge, but the knowledge we gain about God activates faith and mission inside of us. Increasing our knowledge of God, learning more about him should motivate a change in the way we live our lives, the way as we contemplate his goodness, his mercy, his glory, we cannot be the same when we actually know it in our lives. Colossians 1, 9 to 12 says this, we are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patient, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. As Christians, we do not keep the knowledge of God to ourselves. As we grow in the knowledge of God, we share it with others so that others can come to know him as well. The faith we profess is God's word, God's word activated in us. Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. God's word instructs us on what to do and how to live as his disciples and also gives us the power to actually do it. So if we go back to Mark 4, the parable that we're looking at today in verse 24, the next verse, says, as, and he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. By the measure you use it, it will be measured to you and more will be added to you. As Jesus continues his parable, we see him challenge his disciples to go beyond just hearing but also acting on what they hear. Those who both receive and assimilate truth that then have their capacity for understanding enlarged and their knowledge increased. As Christ's disciples, if we hear some sort of command from the word of God but fail to obey and live it out, then there is no way for us to pass it on to others. It's almost meaningless that we know it to begin with, but don't act on it. What gives power to the teaching and commands contained within Scripture is when people see the truth, the light displayed in those who call themselves Christians. And accumulating knowledge, again, is not enough. Knowledge of God needs to be active, must activate us to deeper faith and trust and passion to shine brightly in the way we live our lives never hiding the light of his truth. So knowledge of God changes your perspective on life, the way that you live it. Knowledge activates. Knowledge activates faith and mission within us. 
Often I find for myself though the biggest hurdle of letting knowledge activate is because we prioritize convenience in our lives. You know, the definition of convenience is the state of being able to proceed with something with little effort or difficulty. Man, that sounds good, doesn't it? Convenience is comfortable and easy. Convenience allows us to live for our own desires. Convenience gives permission for us to be lazy. If we apply convenience to our lives as followers of Jesus, we will always make discipleship optional. In a culture of convenience, we'll always resist the heavy lifting and the patience that's necessary to call us into something bigger than ourselves. So friends, we need to replace the culture of convenience and prioritize conviction. Conviction means a deep personal belief. Those of us who follow Jesus have a deep personal belief in Jesus, in his life, his death, his resurrection, and part of the conviction we have as his disciples is that we are to follow his commands. Convictions aren't based on emotions or feelings, but deeply rooted in truth and lived out in obedience. This, this is what it means for us to be a lamp on a lampstand, not covered or hidden. In Acts 20 to 21, we read about Paul's third missionary journey. And this is the one that would take him to Jerusalem. And even before he gets to Jerusalem, Paul knew through the Holy Spirit that an uncertain future and probably a not nice future was waiting for him in Jerusalem. In Acts 20, verses 22 to 24, it says this, Now I am on my way to Jerusalem, compelled by the Spirit, not knowing what I will encounter there, except that in every town the Holy Spirit warns me that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. But I consider my life of no value to myself. My purpose is to finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. Wow, what an uncommon conviction that we see in Paul here. And later on in Acts 21, others, out of care and concern for him, try to convince him to to end his trip and to turn around. They care for Paul. They didn't want to see him suffer, but Paul answered by asking, what you are doing weeping, and what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? He was telling them that he loved them as well, but the Spirit of God has convicted him to go. Well, while I was uh, studying in seminary, I had the privilege of being mentored uh, by a man named Dave Roberts. Dave was uh, on staff at Tyndale, and he was in charge of all the short-term missions trips that the school would send out every, send out every year. Every year, there'd be uh, nine uh, to ten uh, short-term mission trips that students would go on, and Dave was in charge of that. And uh, you know, because I was part of some of the mission stuff that happened at Tyndale, uh, I spent a lot of time with Dave and uh, was able to be mentored by him. And Dave, before, uh, and keep in mind, this is the early 2000s, um, and you know, Dave, before he started working at Tyndale, him and his family were missionaries in Zambia for almost 20 years. And you know, over, over all the different conversations and time I spent with Dave, there's so many things that I look back on, on that time and on those years, so many things that I learned from Dave. But there is one thing that really stuck out. And it wasn't a teaching moment. He was just telling me about his time in Zambia. And in the 80s and the 90s, when you answered that call to become overseas missionaries, part of the training that you receive is preparing for your death that when you answer the call of God to go into the mission field, one of the possible outcomes is that you may lose your life sharing the gospel with people that have never had the opportunity to hear it. Does the gospel grip our hearts to go to this extent? Does the gospel grip our hearts to go to that extent today? You know, the call placed on us as disciples of Christ 
It isn't to be haphazard and to go out looking for dangerous situations, to unwisely put ourselves in situations that, uh, where we might get hurt. That's not the point. The point is to know that being true disciples of Christ will require us to choose conviction over convenience. When we get to this parable that we've been looking at at Mark, it was written 65 to 70 CE, and it was written during a time of persecution of Christians from the Romans for their belief in Jesus. Jesus' intention in using this parable to teach his disciples and to challenge his disciples, his intention was to remind them of this incredible treasure that has been given to them, and it is worth every hardship and challenge they face. One of the promises made by Jesus here is that every time we acquire the fresh truth and allow it to become real in our lives, we can be sure that more truth will be given. As we continue on, the next verse, verse 25, says, for whoever has, more will be given to him, and whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So the more you have, the more you'll be given. And the opposite of this is a necessary reminder as well. Failing to respond to the truth, disbelief or indifference will lead to us losing whatever understanding we had before. And then we live our days ignorant of the truth. But note the progression in this verse. As we allow knowledge of God to activate faith, more knowledge is given. As more knowledge is given, the greater the activation and desire that grows within us to choose conviction over convenience. A lamp, put on a lampstand, illuminating the room, shining bright for all to see. There is nothing greater in life when every single day you wake up and the gospel just grips your heart. May the knowledge of God that grows in us not just accumulate, but activate faith and mission in us as we live as his disciples. May we choose conviction over convenience for the sake of the advancement of the gospel. May we take the truth that we've been given and shine bright, making it obvious to the world that we were made to do this that we were made to be his disciples. So many of you know that this past week, our family uh, was on a vacation, uh, and we had the uh, awesome opportunity to spend some time and a few days at Disneyland in California. Uh, lots of fun, but I gotta say, also very tiring taking two little kids to Disneyland. Uh, but we had a great time, and you know, if you know anything about Disney, Disneyland in California, Disney World in Florida, you'll know that Disney is just one of these companies that is at the forefront of, of hospitality, of creativity, of innovation, and entertainment. You know, when you go to Disneyland, you're literally stepping into these different worlds, and sometimes you have to remind yourself that you're still existing in this reality. It's, it's so cool. This past week when we were at Disneyland, one of the first days we were at the park, we were lining up to go on the Peter Pan ride. And uh, you know, it's, Disneyland's also a very busy place, so those lines can be pretty long. So we were in the slime, we were waiting, and all of a sudden there's a bit of a commotion. And a little bit ahead of us, there was an older man, looked probably in his 80s, uh, and it was a pretty hot day and he had passed out in line. And um, you know, people were trying to help him, people were trying to get him water, his family was with him, and we're trying to call over uh, some of the, the staff there to, to come and help. And once the staff realized what was going on, they started trying to clear people so that they could get in and, and give this man some assistance. And uh, that was a moment where the reality of our humanity is revealed in a really, really terrible way. Here's this man, pass it on the floor. We don't even know if he's alive. 
And when they announced that they were shutting the ride down because of a medical emergency, all you could hear was, ah, oh, are you serious? And the lady behind us actually said to me, can we just step over him? And, you know, that's a, that is one of the indicators of the darkness of the reality that we live in today reminds us of how important it is for us as followers of Christ to shine in the midst of that darkness. You know, darkness today often finds itself in the, force, in, in the form of narcissism, self-centeredness, for, like we found at Disney, some, for some foregoing any care for other people. Darkness can take the form of addiction, racism, and even something like passivity. This is the dark that we shine bright in, church, as those who have listened and received the light of Christ in our lives. And one commentary that I read earlier reminds us that light illuminates, but it also deters prowlers, another reason for us to shine bright. And oftentimes when we recognize and see darkness around us. It feels like the right thing to do. It feels natural to avoid it or to shelter ourselves from it. You know, here's the thing, though. If a lamp is put on a lampstand to shine, I don't have a lamp, so I'm going to use my cell phone. <laughs> you know, if a lamp is put on a lampstand to shine in light, it doesn't do what it is meant to do because it's surrounded by light. It's just there, it just exists. But in darkness, in darkness, the absence of light, this is the environment where light shines bright and makes a difference. We can turn that light back on. I don't know if that actually worked or not, but hopefully it did. But you guys get it. In a world, you know, in a world where there is constant and increasing tension between what is good, what is evil, tension between the light of truth and the darkness of our day, we shine bright. We don't hide. We let our knowledge of God activate our faith and our discipleship. We choose conviction over convenience so gripped by the gospel that we would do anything for others to be changed by it the way that we have. We show the world that we were made for this. We were made to be his disciples. I want to end tonight by reading one of my favorite passages in scripture. It always has served as this important reminder for me at every turn of my life, and this is taken from Romans 10, 13 to 15. It says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? This is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. We are messengers. Lamp that are meant to be on lampstands, not covered and hidden. Shine bright, church. Let's pray. Jesus, we are so grateful. So grateful for the salvation that you have given to us and offered to us, for the promise of eternal life as we seek deeper and um, stronger faith in you. We know that we can be that lamp that shines bright for the world to see. Jesus, I pray that you would challenge us to not grow passive, to not grow lazy, to not choose convenience, but as we 
grow in our knowledge and of our understanding of who you are, your character, your heart, that we would always choose conviction over convenience, that we would be a church, that we would be people that don't hide in embarrassment or fear, lacking in, in confidence, but that we would be people that are just excited at every opportunity that we have to shine bright and share with others this incredible hope that we have in you. So Jesus, as we uh, move about our days, as we try to figure out all the different situations that you place us in, the hard ones, the good ones, may we be reminded that everything we do is our act of worship and submission to you. So Jesus, work in our hearts, work in our lives, help us to shine bright for you. We pray this on your name, amen. Why don't we stay standing? I'm going to invite you now to take out your communion elements. You should have received it on your way in. Uh, if you didn't receive it, just put your hand up and uh, Eugene can get, get it to you if you need it. 
You know, whenever we have the opportunity to gather for communion, we remember and reflect on the life that Jesus lived, his obedience that led him to his death on the cross. His death on the cross that would bring death but would also give light to his resurrection and the assurance that we have that our sins are forgiven and that we can have eternal life with him. So as we come to the communion table together to end our time together tonight, we partake with gratitude because of this life that has been given to us through Jesus. We also recognize that this is the light that shines to offer everyone a hope that cannot come from anything or anyone other than Jesus, the way, the truth, the life. So friends, we invite you to the communion table tonight. Not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because of any goodness of your own that gives you a right to partake, but come because you need his mercy and his help. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come in the knowledge of a reality where death could not hold our Savior to the grave. So here at Beulah, we have an open table. And that means anyone that has professed faith and trust in Jesus is welcome uh, to partake in communion regardless of where you find yourself on, in that journey and then in the, that process and relationship. So on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Friends, let's pray together. Your death, O oh Lord, we commemorate. Your resurrection, we confess. Your final coming, we await. Glory be to you, O oh Christ. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace, and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us so we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship. <clears throat>